Welcome to the Free Range Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Livermore. This episode is sponsored by the program on law, communities, and the environment at the University of Virginia School of Law. With me today is Jonathan Colmer, a professor in the economics department here at UVA. Jonathan is also a director of the Environmental Inequality Lab, and his research touches on environmental economics, development economics, and the distributional impacts of environmental policy. Jonathan, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So I thought we might start off the conversation with a paper that you published um, a couple of years ago with with several colleagues. It came out in in uh, one of the premier journals in the world, Science. And this paper was on uh, in, uh, inequities, or we could say the di- kind of the distributional characteristics, let's say, of uh, air pollution in the United States and how that kind of has changed or not changed as a consequence of environmental policy, things like the Clean Air Act and so on over the last several years. So maybe we could just kind of start off by talking a little bit about that paper, what what led you to that project, what was the little bit on the methodology and the findings, and and then uh, I'm sure that will give us plenty plenty uh, of a runway to uh, to start the conversation. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Um, so yeah, with this with this work, you know, we 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 wanted to really try and understand in a more systematic way the distribution uh, of air pollution in the United States. Um, there's been a, a huge amount of research uh, over time in, in sociology and in public health and in other fields, including economics. But you know, a lot of it has uh, tended to to focus on sort of more local case studies, highlighting uh, the uh, disparities that we see in exposure to environmental risk. It's, it's well established that that disadvantaged communities are disproportionately exposed to, to greater environmental risks like air pollution. Um, but we don't didn't have as much of a, a sort of systematic understanding of this uh, for reasons of measurements and, and other considerations, uh, and so we wanted to uh, try and provide a, a broad understanding of of what disparities in in fine particulate matter, which is a particularly uh, damaging form of, of air pollution, looked like uh, in the United States across uh, different neighbourhoods, uh, and and also really to think about how this has evolved over time. So what we, what, the reason that we were really able to, to answer this question is, is the increased availability uh, of new satellite data and other ways of measuring air pollution, uh, which allowed us to get really high resolution uh, information on exposures to, uh, on the concentrations of, of fine particulate matter uh, for many neighborhoods in the United States. Like we're talking over 60, 65,000 census tracts. Uh, in total, uh, going back to the uh, early 1980s. Uh, and so this allowed us to sort of look at how exposures uh, to fine particular matter have been distributed uh, across space and across time. And, and what we find in terms of the, uh, the sort of core result was that while there have been sort of substantive reductions uh, in, in air pollution in, in fine particular matter over the sort of last four decades, uh, Really, sort of the disparities that we we see uh, we saw back then and see today have, have really persisted. So we see that in terms of uh, the the spatial distribution of pollution, the most polluted areas uh, in 1981 are still the most polluted areas today, uh, and the least polluted areas in 1981 are, are still the least polluted today. Yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting it's a really interesting um, um, kind of. Uh, as you said, like the ability to kind of track these issues both temporally and spatially is really, really interesting. You know, part of, I think, w- one of the things that strikes me about this is, you know, I think it raises the question about how to think about these disparities from a kind of a normative perspective, right? Um, and I, I wonder if we might talk about that a little bit. So like, cool. if um, I can imagine kind of two arguments happening simultaneously, and I'm, I'm curious what you think about these. So on the, on the one hand, I can I think on its face, we could say, look, this is a problem. <laughs> you know, we, we have disparities, um, you know, that's bad. Well, you know, we think that people should have equal access to a clean environment or, you know, that's kind of a norm that we would like to have in society. And that's, and that's not happening here. On the other hand, I can imagine an alternative reading, which is something along the lines of, well, what we're seeing here is, you know, this is a happy story. Like I'm like, we're improving uh, air quality across the board. So it's not the case that the same 
areas that were polluted in the early 1980s are still as polluted as they were in the early 80s, right? They're getting cleaner. The cleaner parts of the country are also getting cleaner. And um, it's kind of a, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats kind of story. We can imagine a similar, you know, kind of story with like healthcare um, that, you know, people are living, if it was the case that people were living longer and um, and their health was improving and so on. But some people, you know, were still were, uh, you know, healthier than others. Um, that wouldn't be surprising in some sense. And it's kind of kind of part and parcel of the overall reality that we live in a society where there's uh, there's inequality. There's some people who have a lot of stuff and some people who have very little stuff. And in, in the environment's just kind of tracking that that larger phenomenon. So I'm curious which one of those normative stories you find kind of more compelling or or, a, or, a, or if there's an alternative take that you have. No, I think I think there are a number. Of, I, I think I agree with what you're saying, right? I mean, yes, pollution has fallen. That's great news, of course. Um, but I think at the same time, you know, ideas of fairness and equity and justice are inherently comparative, right? And we, we do care about who is advantaged and who is disadvantaged. And so what are kind of results show is that those who are disadvantaged and those who are at advantage remains remarkably stable over time. And that's, I think, important to understand. I think that there's also a sense in which, you know, we see that there are these, these reductions in, in pollution, which have been largely proportional. Um, and as an economist, that sort of raises questions for me mm-hmm. about, about, you know, about how these reductions have arisen as well. Because I mean, if we think about the cost of reducing pollution, and it's you know it's not zero. Um, one, uh, my prior at least, you know, would be that that reducing that sort of first unit of pollution is a lot cheaper than reducing the last unit of pollution, which would be incredibly, infinitely costly, right? And so, the fact that you know we see these proportional reductions, such that there's been you know, a 70% decline in the most polluted places and the least polluted places is a, it has implications in terms of the allocation of resources that we are uh, expending in terms of trying to reduce pollution. Right. Yeah, that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting point. Just to maybe kind of reiterate it is um, there's kind of two things that we could be thinking about simultaneously here. One is the equity and distributional kind of consequences of this. Um, you know, if, if one of the thing, if one of the goals of um, laws like the Clean Air Act was to reduce disparities, um, it doesn't seem like they're, they're, it's being very effective in that in that sense. Um, so that's kind of one general kind of set of concerns. The other one that that you just raised is is an efficiency concern, right? Kind of very traditional economic <laughs> concern, right? Is that, uh, wait a second, it should be the case that the cheapest, easiest um, places, uh, reductions to get are, you know, in places where the air is somewhat dirty um, and that uh, cleaning up the air in places where it's already quite clean should be expensive. Um, and so why is it that uh, we've seen, it seems like we're spending more money than we need to per unit of of, of reduction. And that, that is quite, quite interesting. I'm curious if you have any, I maybe have some hypotheses. Do you have any hypotheses for why we kind of see the, um, the pollution reduction allocation, the way that we, the, the way that we see it? Yeah. I mean, so just to, to touch on the efficiency point as well, I mean, I think it, even the efficiency point does come back to these ideas of, of equity and inequality as well, right? Because we, we you know, we distinguish between ideas of distributive justice, right, in terms of outcomes. But it's almost a sense in which, you know, when we're thinking about the the, the allocation of resources to reduce pollution, that, that comes under, it's slightly differently to how we might normally think about it, but it comes under a more of a procedural uh, justice concern as well, right, in terms of who is the allocation of resources to, to deliver those outcomes. Um, in terms of hypotheses, I mean, at, at the highest level, and we don't, we don't have, uh, I think this is still an open area of, of, of research, really, on, in terms of understanding the causes of, um, of these disparities. Um, but, you know, to me, it, it suggests that, you know, the reductions in, uh, in pollution that we've seen have been more driven by sort of broader aggregate patterns. So one might think of technological change uh, and, say, federal policies like cafe standards and uh, and other sort of transport r- related policies more so than uh more localized policies uh 
that to the degree that localized uh, or local policies are are contributing to reductions in in air pollution um which we 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 have evidence that they are in terms of understanding the effects of non attainment uh through the clean air act and and in consideration of that but it it's not that signal is not coming through as strongly as these sort of more aggregate patterns that we're seeing i think in, at least in terms of relative uh reductions now it's it's not fair to say that 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 the the clean air act hasn't uh reduced absolute disparities uh my mm -hmm. long standing colleague and, and co-author john voorhees uh who's a, a principal economist at the us census bureau has a great paper uh that's just coming out in the american economic review with uh, janet curry and, and reed walker that shows that the clean air act has helped to reduce absolute uh disparities in terms of uh black white gaps in air pollution uh so there has been sort of contributions of these policies to improving um absolute disparities in terms of the the, the gaps in exposure mm -hmm. um at the same time those gaps are inherently bounded at zero <laughs> uh and so those gaps are are going to you know get smaller more most mechanically as uh air pollution falls uh which is why i i think it's also important to understand uh relative disparities as well Right. And, th and there's a story that the kind of an alternative world where things could have get gotten where disparities could have gotten worse, even where could have gotten worse and even absolute disparities could have gotten worse yeah. uh, with air pollution control. If the cleanest parts of the country got, you know, kind of cleaner and the dirtier parts of the country didn't get cleaner at all. Right. Um, like that in theory, in theory could have happened. And it's it's good that that didn't happen, at least. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and I it's. It's possible that uh, you know there are there are concerns that those gaps uh, in more recent years may have been getting worse. Um, mm -hmm. That there may have been a reversal, and I, I think this relates to our sort of broader interests uh, in environmental risk that sort of stem beyond thinking about air pollution in a, in a traditional sense. But but for example, you know, recent increases in wildfire activity. Mm -hmm. uh, Really threaten to reverse some of the gains that we've seen in 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 terms of reductions in air pollution, mm. um, and uh, and with climate change, these are expected to uh, not get better anytime soon, to say the least. Right. And so, and and that's a problem that is a harder problem to manage uh, in terms of uh, in terms of reducing the air pollution that is generated through uh, through those more natural events. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's a whole kind of these next generation questions really pose all kinds of all kinds of difficult, all the kinds of difficult challenges. Um, just in terms of the thinking, kind of thinking through the causal and the normative story, um, as we're talking about, it, it's just kind of gets more and more interesting, I think, in some ways, because there's also kind of increasing marginal harm, too, that we might think in the in the context of air pollution. Right. So, um other things being equal, we we would actually, you know, putting aside even concerns about fairness and, and disparities and equality per se, and we just were focused entirely on harm reduction, it would make sense likely to address harms in the um, in the most, you know, in places where you have the highest concentration. So those are both where you would should get the cheapest reductions and also where you get the most harm reduction benefits. So, so those, those really provide, I think, a, you know, very compelling kind of efficiency, um, dilemma, uh, for, um, for the results that you guys see. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, as with, uh, the objective of any good descriptive work, you know, is that it ultimately raises more questions than it answers. Um, and, uh, that's one of the things I'm so excited about the work that we're doing at the moment, which is, you know, we're, we're getting a, a, a much, uh, at least broader understanding of what's going on as well as, you know, being able to raise new questions and dig into those more deeply to, to try and get to the causes of these disparities and, and their consequences. Yeah. I mean, one, one interesting, I mean, coming from a kind of a legal perspective, the one thought that comes to mind is that our, our policy instruments might be part of the story as well. Um, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, for example, in principle alone, could um, uh, could a lot could, could redu reduce disparities, right? Because the idea with with the NACs, as you know, is to um, kind of set a minimum standard that every jurisdiction is supposed to meet. But we've chosen in the U.S. to augment the 
the, the kind of national uniform ambient standards with uh, other kind of uh, uh, overlays, including um, the pre- Prevention of Significant Deterioration Program, which uh, requires uh, uh, cleaner parts of the country to remain clean um, it rec- and makes it kind of more difficult for them to, or the idea is that it stops them from kind of polluting up to the level of NACs in most, in most circumstances. And then we have other parts of the country that are just, we essentially allow for them to be in what's, what's called non-attainment, where, you know, they kind of go for decades not um, coming into compliance with the national uniform standards. And so there likely is a story there too, as well, um, as opposed to alternative, you know, approaches like a cap and trade system or some other mechanism where getting, there would be much more of an incentive to get the cheapest reductions first. um, Whereas that's really not how our, how our system is set up. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I, in understanding sort of the contribution of, of policy uh, and different types of policies to the the more distributional outcomes it is, it is incredibly difficult to get at. Uh, one of the uh, people who are doing very interesting work on this is uh, Danae Hernandez-Cortez at Arizona State University. Um, she has a great paper with Kyle Meng that looks at the um, trying to understand the cap and trade uh, system in California and, and understanding mm-hmm. how the reductions in pollution uh, that that you see as a consequence of that program, how those were distributed, and understanding how I mean, one of the most complicated things about thinking through the distribution of pollution is that it's not necessarily uh, to do with proximity to the facilities themselves, um, because that pollution gets transported, mm-hmm. uh, and so you know whether depending on how you you look at that, at how you measure. The pollution exposure, whether you're looking at people who live uh, just around the facilities or if you're looking at uh, the transportation of that pollution uh, through a sort of chemical transport models, which are thinking about how that pollution is carried uh, by the wind, you can get very different answers. Uh, and I think one of their, their, their real contributions is to show that sort of the careful measurement of, of how this pollution is, is transported is uh, is really important in um, in understanding these considerations, uh, and I think that that plays a role in terms of thinking about national ambient air quality standards as well, because you know we're we're measuring pollution in a particular location, um, but then you have other factors that are potentially contributing to to pollution in that area that were not uh, you know, sourced from that location, uh, either through again wildfires or or from pollution in in, in neighbouring. Uh, counties or states, and so it's uh, is an incredibly complicated uh, sort of causal chain to to disentangle to to really even measure uh, the distribution of exposure. And in terms of getting at the causes, it's 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 straightforward to sort of take images from satellites to understand in a given location and time what is exposure, but it's a completely different uh, kettle of fish to understand the source of that exposure. That's incredibly difficult. It's, 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 you know, it, it's a kind of an irony of the Clean Air Act that it took decades before the federal government really kind of used the Clean Air Act to address interstate air pollution. It was basically something that sat on the shelf for, um, you know, many presidential administrations. And it was, wasn't really until the, the George W. Bush administration that, um, no, the Clinton administration to some degree. I mean, of course, you can, there's always a free history. But the point is, it took several decades to really get serious about air, interstate air pollution. Another factor, too, that's interesting in, in the uh, kind of the reality, as you were, as you're noting, that kind of on the ground reality of exposure is that people move. And so it's an interesting um, finding that you have that it's, you know, we can probably assume that there are some persistence in, in you know, human habitation and, and land over time. But what you're really finding is that it's it's like particular places that remain um, that remain relatively more polluted than others, physical places. And presumably there's some flow of people through those places. So it's I don't know if it's odd or if it's ex- expected at some level that what we would be finding is that or what your findings are is that it's it's kind of linked, it's geographically linked rather than perhaps like linked to specific individuals. 
Yeah, I mean, so um, one of the major limitations of our, our our science paper is that you know we are we're not measuring individual exposure; we're measuring uh, place, uh, and that sort of started uh, really. Um, it was the starting point for for our thinking um, that that resulted in in the environmental inequality lab coming into a, into into reality, which was that in all of this, you know, when we're thinking about communities, communities are people, and so we want to understand, we want to move from a, a place based understanding of environmental inequality uh, to a person based understanding, mm-hmm. um, because. Just as there are you know, differences in exposure, there's differences in mobility and differences in income. And almost all of the literature to date, uh, thinking about environmental inequality uh, within economics, at least uh, using in terms of quantitative research, has, has tended to use place-based measures using uh, census tract or county level characteristics such as the share of the population that is uh, in, a, in a disadvantaged community or the share of the population that is non-Hispanic black or non-Hispanic white or Hispanic um, or, you know, what is the median income. Um, but in all of that, it's very difficult to sort of think about what those considerations mean uh, and how that actually maps then from, from place to people. And, uh, and really, the, the goal of the Environmental Inequality Lab uh, going forward in it and, and what we've been doing for the last few years really has been really trying to move from a, a place-based to a person-based understanding. And that's been uh, really the result of, of the, the research partnerships that, that John Voorhees uh, and I have, have, have been uh, forming. As I said, John is uh, one of the principal economists at the U.S. Census Bureau. And so for the last few years, we've been building a, a data infrastructure, uh, which in effect um, is, provides really detailed information uh, on the distribution of exposure to many environmental hazards. Uh, we've been looking at air pollution, obviously building on our earlier work, but we're also interested in exposure to extreme heat and flood risk and sea level rise, the effects of hurricanes, wildfires and wildfire smoke. Uh, as well as a, a, an area, you know, thinking about energy security and, and the clean energy transition as well and other, other measures of environmental uh, policy and regulation. But in what we, the, the data that the U.S. Census Bureau has allows us to effectively uh, follow uh, at the individual level almost everyone, almost every legal resident in the United States uh, for the past two decades. So we, you know, we've been building this data infrastructure uh, and it's it's an ongoing process, but it, it, it's all anonymized, of course, and highly confidential. Um, it requires uh, lots of federal background checks to even be able to get access to the the, the data uh, in the first place. But we've effectively managed to uh, and and to construct sort of residential histories, so the addresses where people uh, live um, over time, um, and so we can see where they move. Uh, and we combine this with the economic characteristics. So we have measures of income from tax return data, uh, and uh, we have information on employment and, and, and education and those considerations. Um, but then what's really interesting is, you know, we also have the sort of detailed information on, on demographics, on, on race and ethnicity. And so this really, I mean, before we even get into the environmental inequality dimensions of it, you know, the, the IRS has tax return data, of course. And they know what the national income distribution is. But by combining this with the information that the census has, we're able to understand what income distributions look like by race. Uh, and so this really then helps us to, to get a lot deeper in terms of our understanding of environmental inequality. Because we can look at individuals who are exposed to the same environmental risks uh, and understand you know, differences in the consequences of those risks. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference uh, in economic outcomes for uh, low income individuals versus high income individuals when uh, when an area is exposed to a hurricane or non-Hispanic black individuals versus non-Hispanic white individuals. Uh, And we can even go as far as say, what is the difference between in in, in consequences for low income non-Hispanic black versus low income non-Hispanic white individuals. 
Uh, and so that that really just opens up a, a, a huge uh, opportunity for us to, to to get into into mechanisms a little bit more and understand sort of the causes of these disparities, uh, as well as a- avoiding some of what we might refer to as aggregation bias uh, that arises from looking at things uh, at the at the place level as opposed to the person level. Because when we're looking at county level characteristics or census tract characteristics, you know, we don't know whether it's the, these things are all correlated. And so when we see that there is, you know, gaps in exposure, uh, is this driven by income? Is this driven by race? And one isn't able to disentangle those things at the place based level. But when you get to the individual level, you are able to see how, how those things are actually uh, what, what's going on at the individual level instead. Yeah, it's really, it's really amazing. It's an incredible uh, data set. And there's just so many possible questions <laughs> that you can imagine um, kind of getting at. Um, I mean, it's just so it's just it's it's vast. And, 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 and again, at the individual level, once you start to link all this together, I mean, the, the one thing that just immediately strikes to me, and I'm just curious is something that you guys have in the pipeline is, there's a lot of exogenous shocks that are happening that you can identify, like hurricanes, for example, um, wildfires, um, even siting as well, right? You can, you know, the siting of a new facility is in some sense an exogenous shock. Um, and so is, is that one kind of one line of your research is to kind of look at the downstream consequences? I mean, presumably, if you have health data, you could look at that. But at the very least, if you have income data, education data, those kinds of bits of information, then, you know, you could really get at at least some of the economic effects of these, you know, and it's a really clean kind of setup for identifying causal relationships. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we broadly split our work up into sort of a couple of uh, areas, you know, we have, we're building first on the sort of what I would describe as sort of systematic facts, you know, the descriptive work that we, we first published uh, with our science paper, but moving from a place-based to a person-based understanding. Mm-hmm. So that's, again, just trying to understand the degree to which, you know, these papers that have uh, historically used place-based measures and place-based characteristics, do those results, you know, can, number one, can we provide more systematic evidence on those results than, than previously? But also, how do the inferences that have been drawn from that earlier literature hold when one moves Mm -hmm. from a a place-based to a person-based understanding. So that's sort of this idea of the ecological fallacy, that the inferences that are, inferences are made about individuals using place-based data. Uh, And when we move to the individual level, do those inferences still hold? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the first thing we're doing. And we're, we're, you know, we have uh, research uh, looking at uh, the distribution of flood risk and sea level rise. We have work on extreme heat, which is being led by a really fantastic graduate student at Harvard, uh, Trudevi Chakma, who's, uh, who's been working with us to, to sort of look at, you know, individual level exposure to, to, to heat disparities. Mm. Um, you know, we're doing work on wildfires. Um, so wildfires themselves, which, are, you know, our exposure to wildfires is uh, themselves is obviously a pretty rare event. And only really tends to affect us a relatively small number of individuals directly. But because of the scope of our data, we can really get into understanding uh, exposure rates and differences at the individual level that, that one wouldn't be able to do uh, as much with, with, with more aggregate data. But then also thinking about the distribution of wildfire smoke. Uh, so wildfires have much broader consequences than just the, the fires themselves. You know, I think the last couple of days, San Francisco has been having the highest particulate matter concentrations all year, uh, that it's had all year, um, as a consequence of, of the wildfires that are going on. And of course, no fires are actually happening in San Francisco themselves. And I, I remember last year, like Charlottesville had uh, had a real spike in particulate matter that ended up being, I think, something like two times above the World Health Organization's standard during sort of the peak wildfire period. And of course, no wildfires are going on uh, anywhere around Charlottesville. But you, I, I remember looking out the window and seeing that the air was very hazy. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, and, absolutely. And looking at the monitors and thinking, wow, that is a huge spike relative to what, what, what air pollution is normally like in Charlottesville, which is, is usually pretty, you know, pretty low. Um, 
and and seeing you know going onto the the satellites and seeing these huge plumes of smoke that were coming out of the west and and, and being transported to to the east coast which was just you know so understanding the distributions of those those exposures at the individual level as well is 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 great and i think particularly in the context of of wildfires it it really allows us to to dig into um our understanding of disparities for for native american populations because normally these populations uh, you know tend to get missed in survey data or in in aggregate geographic data because they're a much smaller share of the population but with wildfires they're a population that are actually pretty disproportionately exposed and and so with the individual level data we have the the statistical power to really uh, provide more comprehensive information on that but yeah so we we do that descriptive stuff sorry and then uh, and then, as you said, well, actually, actually, why don't why don't we well, we can kind of go to the causal stuff in a second. But I thought it might be worth um, for folks who who aren't as familiar with this stuff to actually just get into the ecological fallacy for a moment to um, you know just kind of emphasize the um, you know the importance of the of the work here and and how it is that you know drawing inferences from a population can can lead you astray with respect to individuals. Maybe with, if, if if there's an example or something in particular that you're looking at right now where you're you're hopeful in, in some sense that you can find that your your new data and your new methods are going to help kind of fine tune or even um, you know kind of improve or even kind of disprove some earlier thoughts, some earlier findings. So one of the things that I, I can talk about um, in terms of results, a lot of our results, a lot of our work is ongoing, and mm -hmm. with this sort of confidential data, uh, there's many more results that I'd like to discuss than I'm able to because they haven't gone through the uh, the disclosure process. Um, but one example of you know, building on the work that we we did in our our, our 2020 science paper um, on air pollution is we wanted to understand things at the individual level in that context too. Mm. And um, and so you know one of the the things that and, and you mentioned this earlier in terms of the fact that people move um, and this gets into sort of hypotheses about the causes of disparities mm -hmm. and you know I, I, we've talked about the fact that that you know low income individuals measured based on geographic information so census tracts that have lower median income tend to be exposed to higher levels of air pollution. And census tracts with a higher population share that is non-Hispanic black also tends to be exposed to higher levels of air pollution. Now, the question in terms of the causes of those disparities in a sort of Econ 101 very simple logic is, you know, is it is it income or is it you know, racial discrimination or other other considerations that are contributing to those disparities, and and that question is pretty first order important uh, because it has big implications for policy, of course. Um, because in all of this, you know, we want more than good in, more than good intentions. We want to make sure we're allocating resources to actually address the fundamental problems that exist. And if the disparities are income. If, if, if the reason for the disparities are income oriented, i.e. the reason that disadvantaged communities are exposed to more pollution is because those communities are poorer and therefore they're sorting and selecting neighborhoods to live in which are cheaper to live in. In that world, uh, or that model of the world, you know, environmental inequality is income inequality. And the way that you address it then is to target income. But in the world that disparities are due to sort of uh, these disparities are, are the result of sort of more systemic uh, institutional factors like zoning uh, and segregation and, and sort of historical policies uh, that have exacerbated broader racial disparities in the United States that we, we, we know and understand. Um, then interpreting these disparities as being driven simply as low income is, is not going to address anything. Um, and so understanding, and, and you can't get at that with, with geographic data because they're just inextricably linked. You can't, you don't have enough variation in the data to be able right. to separate these things out. But moving from a place-based to a person-based understanding, we can, we can get closer. 
And so one of the things that we see in terms of the, this, this idea of understanding an ecological fallacy, this aggregation bias, is that if you look at the relationship between, say, county level or census tract level income and pollution exposure, you see sort of almost a U-shaped relationship. So higher income areas tend to be more polluted than New York's and Los Angeles mm -hmm. of the United States. And then lower income communities are also exposed to more pollution. And then, you know, it, there's lower average exposure in, in the middle. But when you move to an individual level, the relationship is, is almost flat. Flat. Almost flat. It's much less uh, curved than, than at, the, at the aggregate level. Um, so which is to say there's, there isn't a relationship. Which is to say that, you know, in terms of the correlation between income and pollution, it's much uh, weaker than, dis than would be inferred at the aggregate, at uh, the geographic level. Uh, and the reason being is that it's it's really that these disparities uh, in exposure or these differences in exposure are, when we aggregate the information up, we're confounding low income and race. And it's really when you get to the individual level, it's the what's left is that there are these very large racial disparities in exposure, but not uh, so much in terms of uh, of income. At least I mean, that's a huge which finding. Is, is really, is really, we're still, I mean, this is, we're still digging into this to better understand what's going on. And it's, again, it's still descriptive, but it's, it's really fascinating to sort of see that, you know, that how sharply that relationship changes when you move from a, a place based to a, a person based uh, sort of understanding of, of, of these disparities. Yeah, I mean, that would, you know, when, when that's all ready to go and, and goes out into the world um, as kind of final work that that could really be huge in terms of the of the uh effect on the discourse um you know broadly and then within policy circles but also as you as you noted the um the policy interventions that we would contemplate are just entirely different if what's kind of quote unquote really happening if what's kind of now we're not saying causally, I guess, but you know you can start to try to draw. You know you can add your descriptive, <laughs> these descriptive findings with a kind of causal model of the world to think about. Well, if income and pollution ex or exposure is just essentially flat, if there isn't a relationship there, then it's pretty clear that what is likely not happening is just income sorting into cleaner or dirtier places based on preferences and budgets. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, one of the nice things with the data is that we're able to see people move, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and even just descriptive, there's been a, a, a really nice paper that, that Nathaniel Hendren uh, and co-authors uh, released a few weeks ago uh, from the Opportunity Insights Group at Harvard, who also used this type of data to engage in broader questions about economic opportunity and inequality. And sort of consistent with some of the things that we see in the data, people are very immobile. They don't move very much. Um, mm. And, you know, it's, I can't remember the exact number that, that, that the Hendren paper gives, but I, I, it's somewhere in the ballpark of, I think, you know, that kids end up, you know, 80% of kids live in the same county as their, as their parents mm -hmm. um, when the kids are grown up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I think, you know, the thing that's, that sort of is, uh, I, I think within academia, there's almost like a, there's a cognitive dissonance with this yes. as well, because, you know, we're all pretty mobile. I mean, I, right. yeah, listeners may recognize my accent as being British. <laughs> um, you know, we move around. Uh, yep. And so that, you know, our priors as to mobility, you know, this is this it really gets at the importance of having the data in a, in a sort of systematic way to get at this stuff, because, you know, the people doing this work are an inherently mobile group of people. And so it, it also highlights the importance of, of combining sort of this quantitative work with, with research that's being done uh, outside of economics, you know, by sociologists and anthropologists, the qualitative work that, that people who are, you know, interviewing individuals on the grounds and, and, and trying to understand their lived experience of all of this. I think the, the complementarities between, 
the sort of the broader descriptive facts that we're able to to generate as well as the, the causal stuff that we can talk more about but but combining that with people's lived experiences and, and trying to reconcile those is 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 incredibly important right absolutely and it's you know i think um you know, the, you know, thinking about the quantitative qualitative point here, something we've talked a little bit about in past episodes of the of the podcast is, you know, data is always going to be reductionist, right? I mean, sure. you, there's there's only so many features that you're going to be able to pick up, and so, um, you know, so one is the issue that you're addressing. We always get better data, so moving from aggregated census tract level down to individual level is a huge improvement. Um, in granularity and and variation and everything else, uh, but of course you know data on uh, data on income isn't everything, and you know even if you got data on health, that wouldn't be everything, and and so you, there's always kind of more richness that could be added um, exactly. one way or the other. Definitely. Um, so yeah, just moving on to the causal stuff. Um, yeah, so that's kind of so one bucket of research is in this descriptive area, and in particular. Um, using the individual, the wonderful individual data level, um, uh, individual level data that you have to um, to examine some of these questions. So, what is the what is the causal bucket look like? Yeah, I mean, so if we stick with pollution for a little bit, just because you know we're on a, we're on a theme, um, you know, in, in light of these disparities that we see in exposure, both aggregate and relative disparities, you know, one of the the core questions that that John and I were particularly interested in understanding was, well, you know, we see that there are there are huge racial disparities in environmental exposure and exposure to pollution. There are huge racial disparities in terms of economic opportunity and uh, inequality. Like, how much of the environmental disparities do we think could possibly contribute to those broader patterns of economic opportunity and inequality? And so. This is an incredibly hard question to answer, but it, it is like it it's a, a really important causal question, right? The the causal question is how much does environmental inequality contribute to uh, income inequality mm-hmm. effectively? And and so how one answers that question is is very challenging because you need to know the causal effect of pollution on on economic opportunity and uh, and 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 income outcomes, and and so that's tricky. Um, but we have a paper uh, that we we released a, a working paper a, a while back, and and have been presenting it uh, at various workshops and conferences this summer. Um, that you know starts by starts with the descriptives, and just says, look, in the raw data, we see that there's a really strong correlation between the amount of uh, pollution you're exposed to and your economic mobility in the United States. So if you are exposed to high levels of pollution, you're less likely to uh, rise up the where you are in the income distribution relative to your parents. And again, that's just descriptive, right? That's a correlational. Mm-hmm. Um, the big question, of course, is that, well, as we know, areas that are more polluted tend to be lower income, tend to be more disadvantaged in a variety of ways. And so is it really the air pollution that's doing this or is it other factors that are correlated with air pollution? And so what we do is we, we try and get closer to the causal effect of air pollution on income and economic mobility by taking advantage of um the reductions in pollution that came about as a consequence of the Clean Air Act. Uh, And in particular, looking at, you know, areas that when the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments came into effect, uh, came into non-attainment immediately um, because they had air pollution that was too high. So the 1990 amendments reduced the the cap, as we've been discussing, the the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for PM10 and, and, and NOx, which is a important precursor to to fine particulate matter. And so, you know, the day before the the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments came into effect, these places were in compliance and then the the bar fell and the next day the law comes into effect and now they're, they've got too, the pollution is too high and they've, they've got to now reduce pollution to become into compliance. And so what we do is we compare individuals that were 
exposed to um, the reductions in air pollution in, in utero during during their prenatal period, because we know uh, the date of birth and locations of birth. So we can see people who are born um, just before versus just after the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And that gives us what we think is, as like this, you know, almost, uh, well, more exogenous, uh, it's a jargon word, but... Uh, external, right, ex- outside, yeah, the model, outside right. of the model, right. you know, right. people, we, we get this reduction in pollution, which, you know, is, is induced by the regulation as opposed to these sort of other more endogenous factors. Again, jargon, sorry, um, yeah. <laughs> but model-based uh, factors. And... Um, and comparing the the kids that were born in these non-attainment areas to the attainment areas allows us to sort of get these reductions in pollution uh, and allows us to then look at how those... So the kids who were born just after, they basically experienced this, this sort of very acute reduction because the kids born just before benefit from the reductions in late, in like in, in childhood, but they didn't benefit from those reductions during the prenatal period. Hmm. And so we have this sort of extra year of clean air for the kids who are born just uh, born after versus those who are born before. And so what we see is that that this additional year of of clean air has really large effects on on later life earnings, age 30 and and, and economic mobility is this sort of upward mobility measure. I, I said, like where you end up in the income distribution compared to where your parents were. And so this gives us something which is a lot closer um, to the, the causal effects of pollution, because we've got this, we, all, if we go all of the variation in pollution that's going on, lots of it's very non-random. We're trying to sort of identify sort of this slice of the pollution pie, which is more random. Right. And in doing so, that kind of gives us more confidence that the effects of pollution on later life earnings that are coming from this slice of the pie are uh, are causal as opposed to correlational. And yeah, we, so we find these really large effects. And then, and then the, the rest of the, the project is really about, okay, well, in, in light of having that estimate, we see that there are large disparities in, 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 in racial ex- exposure to, to, to pollution. And so if we take that, if we, if we, at the individual level, if we look at disparities at birth for each cohort, uh, in terms of black exposure to pollution in utero and, and white exposure to pollution in utero. And then combine that with our understanding of the causal effects of in utero exposure to later life earnings, how much of the black white gap uh, in uh, earnings at age 30 can be uh, accounted for mm-hmm. in just a simple descriptive sense by our understanding of the causal effects of pollution on earnings. And we find it, you know, very large effects, like almost 20, 25% of the black white earnings uh, gap could be uh, accounted for by black white disparities in pollution at birth. And that's, you know, that's a very big effect. And, and there are lots of, uh, you know, simplifying assumptions that go into, into the, the sort of that back of the envelope calculation. But, you know, even if we're off by an order of magnitude, like these effects are, are, are meaningful. Like we, we're not suggesting that you take 25% seriously to you know three decimal places um but it just highlights that that these disparities in in pollution given our understanding of the physiological effects that pollution has on child development and and other considerations that that this exposure really does have uh, can account for like a non-trivial amount of the economic disparities that we see that's a fascinating fascinating paper fascinating work um just to, um, yeah, just to get kind of back to some of our, our terms. I mean, I think ultimately you got at it. We said what I always, how I always explain this stuff to folks is, um, you know, essentially it's it's a quasi random thing, right? So you're trying to de-link the exposure from other kind of plausible things that are happening uh, yeah, to, exactly. to simulate in some sense a random, random control, randomized control trial. So here's a, here's a question for you. I'm sure you've, you've answered um, versions of this. <laughs> I'm curious what you think about it. So, it strikes me that one. Okay, so what's happening here is we've got um, we've got two kinds of um, air quality districts. Ones that go into non-attainment as a consequence of the Clean Air Act, and therefore um, 
there will, where there will be pollution reductions, mm-hmm. right? And then you're controlling with the with the count with the air quality districts that are stay in attainment, right? Where where the where the new law doesn't af- doesn't affect, they don't have to make any additional investment. Okay. So the kids born before and after in attainment areas, they're in compliance. Their air pollution isn't changing. So those kids right. are exposed. There's no difference in exposure for the kids born before or after right. the 1990 Clean Air comes into effect in attainment districts. Got it. So you've got like a four, a two by two, right? You've got kind of born before the act in, atta- in areas that were in attainment and stay in attainment versus before that were in attainment and then move into non-attainment basically, right? Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, one, just curious your your thoughts on this kind of as a as a cosmos because twenty five percent does sound like a huge. Oh huge yeah, I mean, and right. it's as I say, like, that's assuming like we're extrapolating linearly right. in terms of our mm-hmm. understanding of these effects, and it's mm-hmm. it's out of sample, right? It, like mm-hmm. there are you know there's there's a lot of assumptions that you know I mean the the paper goes into it in a lot more depth, but it's you know. It's a it's a it's a thought exercise. Right. It's not a it's not like a this number is the truth. Right. Let's, a, uh, let's start making bets on it. Right. We take a lot of care to get at what we and identify like the causal effects of mm-hmm. prenatal exposure to pollution, but then we want to sort of use that number to get a broader understanding of its potential contribution to these broader patterns of disparities that we see. Yeah, it's really interesting. So one, um, just curious what what you think about this kind of as a as a possible kind of uh, pathway or kind of um, supplemental pathway. Because we normally think of um, negative economic consequences from environmental policies, putting aside the um, the positive environmental benefits, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's costly to, to invest in pollution control. And so one, assuming people don't move, which is a little bit of a, as you know, um, well, kind of putting that issue to the side for a second, we might think that, you know, um, as between areas that were kicked into non-attainment versus attainment, that there would actually be less economic opportunity in the places that were kicked into non-attainment because they had to make these investments in pollution control technology, which then, you know, some would argue is going to be a, a drag on their local economy. And so I think there's a kind of extra interesting finding here, which that doesn't seem to be the case. What you're actually finding is that, um, or at least with respect to this one population, that non that getting kicked into non-attainment is actually good from the perspective of at least reducing economic inequality or improving, actually improving economic mobility, right? Because you're looking at people moving out of their parents' uh, income uh, decile or whatever, right? Um, so that's interesting. I mean, the other one other kind of thought that just comes to mind is it's a little bit down the road, but as it's it's maybe it's possible that when you kick a, uh, an area into non-attainment, that actually creates jobs for the, in the local economy, and there would be a difference in pollution exposure over time. But also, what's kind of going on is. Um, there's some economic opportunity happening as a consequence of, you know, investment in, in air quality control. Yeah, I mean, so I think there, there are a couple of things to, to touch on here. Number one is that what we're identifying in terms of the effects of prenatal exposure to non-attainment, right, mm-hmm. is going to be the net effect of of, of those, those competing channels. Mm-hmm. So if mum and dad lose their job because the factory gets closed down, that's a, a, a bad shock, but the reductions in pollution are a good thing. Um, now, for the most part, like, you know, our understanding of the, the effects of non-attainment in terms of the economic consequences of non-attainment, you know, Reed Walker's uh, work comes to mind. I mentioned Reed as a co-author of John and uh, earlier. Uh, you know, he, he's done great work to try and understand the economic costs of, of the Clean Air Act. And you know, for those in in industries that were directly affected, you know, it, it is costly. Um, people do lose their jobs. There is displacement. They find new jobs. It's not a permanent shock, but but there is an economic cost to that. But the share of the population that are directly affected is very small, like less than 0.7 percent. I think is is the number. Whereas the reductions in pollution benefit everyone in the community. 
and of course we you know what we were showing in the paper is really the, the benefits to those in in in, in who had, who had not been born yet really the people in gestation um but we see that there are benefits to people in early to kids in early childhood as well and then those effects sort of dissipate as you get older um but really you know okay so the the, the benefits of of the of non-attainment you know have to be obviously compared to the costs but i think we we tend economists have tended to historically overestimate or overstate the costs and underestimate and understate the benefits. And I think our understanding of the science over time in terms of the effects of pollution, uh, as well as the more recent work that we've been able to do, have, have highlighted the economic benefits of pollution reduction as well as the, the health benefits. I mean, touching on what you were saying about jobs being created within the economy, we don't have results on this, but, you know, people are healthier. They're, they are earning more because they're more productive. Uh, and so the reductions in pollution uh, benefit the local economy because workers are being more productive, and that 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 you know means that people are earning more, and that firms are earning more, and and so for the the indirectly you know for the for the firms and the sectors that aren't directly affected uh, as a consequence of non-attainment, there are there are larger benefits, I think, and we there hasn't been a lot of work to sort of accurately and precisely quantify this stuff but um suggestive you know the, the the health benefits and the earnings benefits points to the fact that the the benefits to the local economy as a whole i think far outweigh the the costs um to to the the, the facilities that are directly affected by the clean air yeah you know it's it, that's very interesting and, and in your comments there kind of put me in mind of another distributional element of environmental policy especially air pollution um, policy in the United States that is just probably underemphasized, which is, um, and including within the economics field. So I'm curious, curious your thoughts about this. But you know, for for decades, it's essentially what we focused as the primary benefit of uh, air quality improvements is reduction in mortality risk. And the reason that we do that in part is because um, we have some good data on it, and. Uh, air quality investments are very well justified purely, especially from the status quo, purely uh, on the basis of this mortality risk reduction. But there's a very important distributional element to this, which is when you reduce mortality risk, you're saving lives. But um, the number of lives saved, actually, which is still kind of large, but it's it's a relatively small group compared to the total population. You might be reducing a risk for a very broad, large number of people, but if it's a one in 10,000 risk or one in 100,000 risk, the actual people that you're helping are the folks who would have that risk be realized, right? Who would die as a consequence of the air pollution. And so we've been focusing our kind of estimation of the benefits of uh, pollution control on um, a category of effects that are inherently very concentrated. They're very extreme, but they're very concentrated. They're not widely shared in some important sense. Whereas the work that you're doing is really focusing on effects that are much more widely shared, even if in, for any individual, you know, a small change in your income is, a, is much less important than you know, dying or not dying, obviously, uh, but it's spread over a much larger population. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Mortality has traditionally been a relatively easy thing to measure. I think more recently, people have doing been doing work on on morbidity as well, uh, so sort of less extreme measures of health. But it's you know the mortality effects are, you know, are hugely important, um, and even by themselves, uh, in terms of work that the EPA has done in terms of cost benefit analysis of, of the Clean Air Act, the, the the benefits in terms of mortality. Uh, you know, are like are very large. I mean, it's not just about uh, the infant mortality effects are, are large. You know, the effects on on older populations as well. Um, although I think there's a lot of scope to do. You know, again, more more uh, nuanced and refined work in this space uh, to to sort of build on the existing work. But yeah, the the under, I think the the sort of the the, the take home in recent years is that the effects of pollution have of just far broader effects. Than, than health alone. Um, income isn't everything, as we've discussed. Um, you know, our measures of income don't, for example, get at the you know reductions in health spending that people benefit from. They can spend their money on other things as a consequence of being healthier. Uh, but you know, I think that the, the fact that we see these sort of broader patterns as well um, just go 
further to effectively add to the benefits column when we're thinking about the the, the gains from improving environmental quality. Yeah. Yeah, as you say, like the, ben- the, the, the main motivation behind a lot of the Clean Air Act was uh, not just mortality, but also just, you know, recreation, right? Mm-hmm. And and amenities. People don't like looking at smoky, dirty factories uh, and don't like dirty water. Um, even so, so but, but yeah, the earnings effects, the, the productivity effects have largely been, been underlooked. And I think that has... That does have a real implication for the this inherent trade-off, which is push, right? You know, the, the environmental regulation kills jobs kind of narrative, mm-hmm. uh, where it's industry versus uh, you know people. But but it's not really the case, right? I mean, because me- very many workers benefit, and many firms consequently benefit hugely from reductions in air pollution because workers are more productive, they're healthier. Saves. Yeah. I, I would go as far as to say that you know. Certainly, on average, I would think that, that the environmental regulation saves firms money more than it, it costs. Especially when, if you think of kind of worker productivity and you know, yeah. all of that, um, absolutely. A healthier, more productive workforce is never a bad thing. No, no, absolutely not. Well, um, Jonathan, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. It's just incredibly interesting and important work, and uh, I appreciate you uh, you doing it and sharing it with us today. Thanks for having me. It's been great talking to you.